Greetings, AP U.S. History Scholars, and we're going to be reviewing the fourth unit, which is on the War of 1812, nationalism versus sectionalism, things like immigration, economic growth, the Monroe Doctrine, various expansion um, to the south and to the north here. So starting with the review sheet from the very top to bottom here, problems with England and France after 1789. Remember that date, 1789 is the French Revolution. Remember George Washington's proclamation of neutrality. We are not taking sides, friends to all, enemies of none, avoiding European entanglement. And France feels betrayed after we renege on the treaty that they had signed earlier with us, uh, helping us during the Revolutionary War. Furthermore, after our independence, we signed Jay's Treaty, which is seen as a treaty of friendship by the French with Great Britain. And the problem here is the French between 1798 and 1800 are going to engage in what's called the quasi-naval war, and they're picking off our ships, which we are trading with goods with both France and with Great Britain. And this later is going to uh, be, also, be met also with the problem with the British are taking our ships, seizing our cargoes, and impressing our sailors, and that's dragooning them into the Royal Navy against their will. Um, U.S. attempts to keep peace with France and England, beginning with Jefferson. Jefferson is going to, um, in 1807, he's going to issue the Embargo Act, and this is going to ban trade with all nations. And the idea here is to put the screws on the British, kind of like we did in the Stamp Act with this embargo to get them to relent, in which they did way back before the Revolution with the repeal of the Stamp Act, and we're hoping that we can avoid war through economic, uh, you know, coercion here on the, on the Brits, and this doesn't work very well, throws New England essentially into depression, and it's narrowed a bit here in 1809 with the Non-Intercourse Act, which says we just won't trade with England and France, and of course the Federalists, the New Englanders, are upset with this and in disagreement, but we are trying to keep the peace, and this continues through the first term of James Madison, who's the president after Jefferson. Why do we go to war in 1812? Well, a number of things intersect here. One is that our trade is being violated primarily by the British here, who are grabbing our ships, grabbing our cargo, grabbing our sailors, which is called impressment. And impressment's kind of complicated. Um, and for one thing, the British do not recognize naturalization, so all of these immigrants who came to the United States working on American ships as American citizens now. This isn't being recognized by the Brits. Once a Brit, always a Brit, and they're being brought into by force as American ships are boarded, brought into the British Navy. Furthermore, many of these um, British or American sailors are Brits that jump ship someplace on the East Coast of the United States, and they have fake papers. And on top of this, you have just the sheer need for sailors. The Brits, um, because they're in war, and war is messy, they're grabbing American sailors. So these things are all converging. Furthermore, we are accusing the British of selling weapons by way of Canada to American industries who are rebelling on the frontier, who are attacking American settlements. And um, the Warhawks are these Western and Southern leaders. Two of the most famous are John C. Calhoun in South Carolina and Henry Clay in Kentucky. And they are advocating um, getting, uh, getting our revenge, getting justice against the British by seizing Canada. And there are some critics, some historians, who say that the motives, at least of these Westerners, Southerners, are not altogether pure. There's this uh, that desire for land expansion heading into the North, and we do attack Canada. Uh, several times, and we do fail there. The, um, but the Warhawks are also using the, the pretext here that the British guns are being found in the hands of American Indians on the frontier. And Tecumseh is the leader of the Shawnee. He's the leader of one of, of this um, Indian confederation that is leading this attack on American settlements. His soldiers are defeated at the Battle of Tippecanoe by William Henry Harrison, and he's hunted down in Canada. He's killed at the Battle of the Thames in what would be Ontario now. Behavior of the Federalists from 1812 to 1815. The Federalists oppose the war. This war is without the vote of the Federalists and their sympathizers in New York and New Jersey, Delaware, and certainly New England, and that would be Massachusetts, Connecticut, um, and Rhode Island and New Hampshire. And so the Federalists are against this war. Why? Because 
it's the war will hurt, hurt their trade. Why aren't they upset about these ships getting grabbed and cargo seized and sailors nabbed? Well, they're making so much money. This is a very, very profitable war that's ongoing. From 1789, basically, to 1815, the French and British are at each other's throats, and we are this quote-unquote neutral party selling to both sides, and the Federalists don't want to give that trade up. In fact, during the war, they do trade with the enemy. And at the very end of the war, 18, um, 1815, the Hartford Convention is going to meet in Hartford, Connecticut, and they're going to protest the war and discuss the possibility of succession. The Hartford Convention during the, this period, 1814 to 1815, there's going to be a proposal that there should be a supermajority to declare war. This war is very unpopular, again, very unpopular with New England. It kills their trade on top of this embargo and Non-Intercourse Act, which had messed with their trade earlier under Jefferson and Madison. They want a two-thirds vote. A super, this is a supermajority, not a majority, but a supermajority to admit new states. And if you notice these electoral maps, over the years, increasingly, the Republicans are seizing control of these western states through the ballot box. And they also want a two-thirds vote on whether or not the president can restrict trade. They're in opposition to this embargo, and there is the threat of succession. The idea of states' rights, you've seen this before, you've seen it, um, this idea given by the anti-federalists who in the first place do not want a stronger government to replace the virtual independence of the states under the Articles. Later on, when Adams issues the Alien and Sedition Acts, Kentucky and Virginia are going to say that this is unconstitutional. They're going to nullify these laws. They're null and void within the borders of Kentucky and Virginia. This is an example of states' rights. And the Hartford, Hartford Convention is an example of Northerners who are latching onto this idea of states' rights. And it's kind of interesting and ironic that this party of big government, the Hamiltonians, are, um, who've always argued for loose construction and for large, strong, active government, are going to be in opposition to large government under the uh, Jeffersonians. And there's a double irony there that the Jeffersonians are doing things like um, threatening a draft, which doesn't happen, and setting up an embargo. And um, remember Jefferson buying Louisiana. These are all things which a small government faction is not supposed to be doing. England's 1815 war strategy. There is this invasion from Canada, which is turned back on Lake Champlain by Thomas uh, McDonough. There is the invasion of uh, Washington, D.C. The government buildings there are burned. And there is the movement farther um, up the Chesapeake to Fort Henry, McHenry in Baltimore, where um, the fort holds out and the flag is still flying, and that inspires Francis Scott Key and the national anthem. And the third prong is an invasion up from Jamaica. And this uh, is highlighted at the Battle of New Orleans, where the commander, Andrew Jackson, is going to defeat quite handily. It's something like 2,000 casualties for the Brits, less than 100 for us. This is a stunning victory, considering that these are the seasoned troops of the Brits that just got on defeating Napoleon for the second time. And the Americans are a ragtag bunch of Tennessee volunteers, um, the U.S. Army, the pirates, uh, free soldiers, fr fr free, sorry, free, free black soldiers and slaves. And there's this belief, the importance of this battle is, first of all, we turn back the Brits, so there is no successful invasion of New Orleans. But there's this belief that we have won an overwhelming victory. We've upheld our pride. We have held on to our independence. There's an increased sense of nationhood. This is one more nail in the coffin for the disloyal Federalists after we have this, this feel-good victory. And there's kind of a feeling that because of this victory, the British surrendered, but they actually surrendered several weeks earlier. There just was no way of communicating this before this battle. The Treaty of Ghent, which ends the war, is a treaty which we say is status quo antebellum. And status quo, ante, status quo is the way things are, and antebellum means before the war. So we're going back to uh, the way things were before the war. There's no fighting. Of course, here there's no more issue because Napoleon has um, been exiled down to St. Helena in the South Atlantic, and there's no, there's no reason for the British to grab our ships. So we just sort of, uh, the war ends. The Monroe Doctrine, this is 1815, where James Monroe, who's the president after Madison, this is our fifth president and our fourth Virginian, he is going to tell the Europeans um, emphatically to stay out of the new nations of Latin America, which declared their independence during the Napoleonic War years. And it's a, st a statement to the Europeans to stay out of Latin America, 
not to interfere with existing countries, not to seize new colonies, and it's a reiteration of our statement that we will stay out of European affairs, out of European entanglement. The air of good feelings, well, remember in the election of 1820, the second, the re-election of James Monroe, um, he is going to win 231 electoral votes to one. This is the second biggest victory in American history. Remember, Washington runs unopposed. He wins all the electoral votes. And the story is that one elector threw his one vote to John Quincy Adams just so that the founding father wouldn't, um, wouldn't have any, you know, any tie in the history books here. And that's, you know, there's some question whether that's why he did that. But the idea here is that this is a time when the Republicans are dominant. The Federalists have folded. They've, they've basically gone as a party because of their perceived disloyalty. And on the face of things, you could argue here under examples of nationalism that the air of good feelings reflects unity and pride and, and peace and, um, and confidence. The country's growing, industry is growing, railroads are growing, canals, roads, uh, early railroads, immigration is up, and there's expansion. Missouri, uh, Florida, the Convention of 1818, which gives us that northern border, border with Canada, joint control of Oregon. There's this feeling that you know our destiny is being written as, as we speak and live. Examples of sectionalism, though, if you're going to be a contrarian, and the AP always wants you to see amb amb ambiguity, to see se several things happening at the same time, you have slavery is becoming an issue here in 1820 with the Missouri Compromise. The tariff is still an issue. Southerners do not like the tariff. They sort of see it as a, because the South doesn't have a lot of manufacturing, they're paying higher prices for um, goods which they feel they can get cheaper if there wasn't a tariff keeping British goods out. And of course, the Bank of the United States is kind of a lightning rod for um, the small, uh, strict constitution, constitutionalists, Jeffersonians who feel that the rich somehow are preying on, on the public and on the poor with this bank. Who's president during the era of good feelings? James Monroe. Missouri Compromise, the issue is in 1820, there's that minimum number, the 60,000 people in Missouri territory who want to become a state. And they, um, they request statehood, but this would upset the balance in the Senate. There's a tie between the number of uh, slave and free states. And the compromise, and this comes from Henry Clay, whose nickname is going to be the Great Compromiser. The compromise is that Missouri will come in as a slave state, Maine will come in as a free state, and that southern border of Missouri will be a dividing line between slave and free territory, that 3630. And remember that, that, that math term, 3630. 36 degrees, 30 minutes, divides the free and the slave territory of the remaining Louisiana Purchase. The Talmadge Amendment, which passes the House but not the Senate, says there would be no more slavery in Missouri after the children of slaves reach the age of 25. So the current slaves, yeah, they're slaves until they die, but after that all these children are free at 25, and it's called gradual emancipation. It's not immediate, but it's gradual. It doesn't happen, but it shows that uh, there's a majority in the House, which represents the majority power of the northern states, that there is something wrong with slavery, that this is something immoral and something that should be um, eradicated. John Marshall is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and his decisions are going to strengthen big business, are going to strengthen the free enterprise system and the power of the federal government. And the case that we've already covered, Marbury versus Madison, is where the Supreme Court takes the right of judicial review, the right to rule a law unconstitutional. McCulloch versus Maryland, remember, the uh, Maryland decides to tax the Bank of the United States, and the Supreme Court says the states can't do this. The states cannot uh, interfere with, with federal institutions, that federal institutions such as the bank are independent of state control. Gibbons versus Ogden, this is that interstate trade issue here where there's a monopoly given on um, interstate trade on ferry boats between New York and New Jersey, and the Supreme Court says that only the U.S. Congress can regulate interstate trade, that New York cannot grant anyone a monopoly, that this is unconstitutional. And this is both a blow for the power of the national government over the states to give these monopolies, but it's also a blow for, this, for free trade, for um, economic growth. Dartmouth versus Woodward, Dartmouth College is suing that uh, New Hampshire has 
ended their charter, which had been given them previously, to be an independent institution. And the Supreme Court rules that a state cannot break a, a contract, cannot break a charter like this. A case that's not on your review sheet, the Charles River Bridge, Charles River Bridge versus the Warren Bridge, this is where a bridge that had been given a monopoly chartered across between Boston and um, to span between Boston and Cambridge, all of a sudden has this new bridge being built, the Warren Bridge just downstream or upstream nearby, and the court is going to rule that um, that the state can give permission, can, can do this, can build this uh, free bridge that's competing with this toll bridge. And again, this is strengthening free trade. It's strengthening free enterprise. It's strengthening business expansion. And this court is certainly pro-business as well as pro-federal government. Remember, um, this is largely weighed with federalists. Treaties with other countries. The Rush Bago Treaty demilitarizes the Great Lakes. No warships on the Great Lakes. This uh, huge body of water between us and Canada has no, no, um, no warships. The adams onis Treaty, also called the Transcontinental Treaty, this is signed by John Quincy Adams and Mr. Onis, our counterpart, gives us Florida in 1819. This is after Andrew Jackson had already moved in and kind of kept the U.S. Army there after uh, hunting down runaway slaves and, and, and Indians who had been attacking us. And this treaty is significant in that it sets the border in the west fairly far south between Oregon and California. It gives us a very favorable border in the west as well as giving us Florida. The great compromiser, Henry Clay, he's the guy who comes up with the Missouri Compromise. Again, you have to memorize those three parts. Maine comes in free, Missouri comes in slave, and 3630 is the dividing line for the rest of the territory. But he's also the thinker-upper of the American system. The American system is a plan for economic independence and self-sufficiency. And the idea here is that there will be a national tariff, a national um, bank, that there will be internal improvements, and all sections will get something out of this um, out of this system of interlocking mutual economic interdependence. That, for example, the tariff will keep out uh, foreign goods and will benefit northern factories, but these factories will consume southern cotton. And in turn, the national government will help build things like canals and roads in the south and the west where they're most needed. The Lowell system slash the Waltham system. Um, Henry Cabot Lowell is a guy who's building textile mills. And remember, Sam Slater is the, the Englishman who brings over the blueprints for the first textile mills in New England, and Francis Cabot Lowell is going to build a mill first on the Charles River outside of Boston. This is his first mill, but the Charles River, I guess, is too sluggish, too slow, too small. So he builds a second mill in Waltham on the Merrimack River. So we have these two rivers, but they're both Francis Cabot's mills, and his, his um, claim to fame is he's looking for a docile, compliant, dependable, work source, and that is going to be young farm girls. And these girls are anxious to, or uh, not anxious, but eager to get off the farm and to live in the city and meet other girls. And they're living kind of in a dormitory type situation, very paternalistic. There's curfews. There's like a house mother. They're supervised, but they're making an income. They're living off the farm. They're in, in becoming independent, and they have some spending money. And very quickly, these girls will be replaced by uh, Irish Irish uh, immigrants who will work even cheaper during this period of the Irish famine. The goal of high tariffs, remember the goal of high tariffs? This is all the way going back to Hamilton. The idea here is to protect American industry from competition, primarily the British. And this is also called protecting infant industry or protecting domestic infancy. The goal is to make American ind industry independent and strong and make us self-sufficient in economic industrial production of small goods, of course, at this time. 1808 is when the international slave trade ends. Um, the Congress was given permission to do this in the original, in the Constitution. So for 20 years, from 1788 to, seven, to 1808, there is continuing kidnapping of Africans and bringing them over on the Middle Passage. But after this, there's no more legal international slave trade. There will be some slave trade through the cracks here, but that would essentially be smuggling. Um, there is the slave trade within the United States. So don't get this wrong here. They're buying and selling slaves in you know, the nation's capital and throughout the South, but there's no more international slave trade. And we do agree to help patrol the coast of Africa with the West African um, slave, slave patrol. 
which is um, us and the British stopping stopping this traffic. So here you have it. Here's our review at the specific review sheet, which you have been given. You better know every one of these things because they reflect something that will be on the test. So signing off here and see you on the test day.